Let's go ahead and uh, start in prayer. Lord be with you. Father, um, I pray that you'll help us this morning to understand um, what you have said through your son, Jesus Christ, especially as we're approaching a parable that can be difficult um, for us to grasp. Open our minds, and more important, Lord, open our hearts so that we can hear your word. Lord, I pray that you will give me your grace so that what I say from this pulpit will be nothing but what you would have said um, in accordance with your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. All right. Um, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to have to put bookmarks in our Bibles today. So let's do that first so that we're not ruffling around in pages as we go on. Uh, we're going to be in the gospel lesson, which is in Matthew 22. That's where we'll be most of our time. But I'm going to have you mark three other places. So if you don't have enough bookmarks, that's fine. Hopefully you can, you're can. you good at the whole Bible thing. You can figure it out. Um, so, so the uh, second place is Genesis chapter 3. Most of you can find that, so you might want to save a marker for that one uh, and not put one there. Um, the next place is Isaiah chapter 64. And... Matthew, again, chapter 7. I probably should have told you that first. So, <clears throat> Matthew 22, Genesis 3, Isaiah 64, and Matthew 7. So, I preached on the wedding feast parable, I, I think I said last week, three times since I've been um, ordained, and... Each time I, I'm such a slow preacher, I make it to like verse 11, and I don't get 10, and I don't get 11 through 14, um, which is where we get the guy who's kicked out of the banquet. And so every time after I preach on this particular text, someone will come up after, after the service and say, what on earth? <laughs> Why is this guy thrown out? And um, I get so many questions about that, I thought it'd be worth our time to not go on in the lectionary, but to continue on and cover this last part of the parable, which we'll do, um, which we'll do today. Now, if you remember last week, the parable in the first uh, six verses is about a king who's having a wedding for his son, and a, he's having a wedding feast, which means the thing is going to probably last for a full seven or eight days. He's having a feast for his son who's getting married. He sends out invitations. Lots of, to, the, to, to some guests, and all of them actually, not lots of them, all of them say, yes, we'll come. They are SVP. They're going to they're gonna be there, um, they say. But then the appointed time comes, and they don't show up, right? That's verses 1 um, through 6. And we said what Jesus was doing here. God um, called Israel through the prophets. God said, one day, one day I'll send a Savior, through him, I will establish my kingdom on earth. And through you, Israel, all nations shall be blessed. It's a great calling. Israel accepted that call. They said, yes. Committed themselves to be the people of God. And then John the Baptist arrived. And said, the time's here. You've accepted the invitation. The party is ready to begin. The one you've been waiting for has come. Repent, be baptized, and enter the feast. They rejected him. They rejected John the Baptist, and they rejected the one John Baptist pointed to. Now, there's an element in our parable of prophecy, because Jesus says... Um, that more messengers are sent. More messengers come. Probably Jesus is talking here about the preachers and the apostles of the New Testament. They're going to come and they're also going to point to Jesus, Jesus as the Savior. And they're going to say to Israel, your Savior has come, the one you've been waiting for. He's offered himself on the cross for your sins, just as the king slaughtered the uh, cattle to prepare for the feast this king allowed himself to be slaughtered so you could all come and, and have living uh, water and bread of eternal life. And he's risen now, and he is your God. Go to the feast, and 
Israel rejected the apostles. So there's an element of prophecy here. Now in verse 7, if you look down, you'll notice that as a result of the rejection of the messengers sent from the king and ultimately their death, they're, they're being murdered, the king sends his army to destroy the original invitees. Now, um, this happened in historically. When Jesus was speaking here, he wasn't just speaking about the fact that those who reject him will face the eternal consequences for their sins. That's there. But he's also saying, the Lord's going to take out your city, which he did in AD 70. So there's, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. So there's both a historical prophecy here and a spiritual element. So all of this, verses 1 through 7, is a warning to Israel, which is, don't reject me. Don't reject me. Don't reject my messengers. You've said you're waiting for God to save you. Here I am. Turn from yourself. Surrender to me and you'll have life. You'll have life. Reject me and you'll die in your sin. There's no like middle way there. right? <laughs> you go to Jesus or not. They don't listen. They don't listen. So the king sends his army. He punishes them. Um, and then after verse 7, what does the king do after he takes care of the original invitees who rejected the offer? What does he do then? Look at your Bible. He sends out an invitation. He invites Everybody else, all right? You guys didn't want to come to my feast? I'll go out into the streets. I'll go out into the byways. I'll issue an invitation to whoever wants to come. He invites everyone else, verses 8 through 10. Um, no distinction, he says, between the good and the bad. Now, we know, we know that there are no such thing. There is no such thing as a good person, right? Jesus said that himself very clearly. No one is good. He said that in this gospel, right? So when, we're, when we have this good and bad, we're not talking good in before God's eyes. We're talking good relatively, right? So some of us are better than others. You compare my life with Anne's life, and obviously I'm more holy. Um, so I'm just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. You compare her. It's actually the opposite. But you compare. You all do that, right? You, can, you see there are some, some of us who are more... Walk the line better than others. We know that. That's all that Jesus is saying. He's talking this is in a relative sense. Okay, I, I, I was lying. It was, you know, it's not true. Um, so basically what this invitation is, is to good and bad, relatively speaking. If you're a teetotaling virgin who never swears, you're invited. If you're a pot-smoking, whiskey-drinking womanizer, you're invited. Come to the feast. That's what this means. That's what he's saying. So we get to the end of verse 10. And what at least I want is Jesus to say the end. And they all lived happily ever after. All who accept the invitation to follow Jesus are caught up in the embrace of God, finished, done, the end. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He takes us into... The feast itself. When the king came in, he says in verse 11, to look at the guests, he saw there a man with no wedding garments. And so he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without your wedding garments? And he was speechless. He said nothing. Now look at verse 13. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does Jesus usually use that imagery to refer to? Eternal damnation. Eternal damnation. Yeah, because the weeping is because people are, are sorrowful because they are living for eternity, bearing the punishment for their own sins. But the gnashing of teeth is because they're angry. <laughs> the reason they're there is they hate God. Right? They're not there um, wanting to get out. They really hate God. Right? That's the image he uses for hell. 
So this guy was cast out of the feast and he's facing eternal consequences for something. And then he ends up with this really exclusive statement there in verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. But wait a minute. The invitation went out to everybody. I don't know about you. I didn't see a dress code mentioned in the invitation. Did you see anything there? To mention a dress code, black tie, you know, nothing there for that. Where did the dress code come from? How can this poor guy be blamed for showing up without a wedding garment? The king, I mean, given past history, the king should just be happy that people come to his party in the first place, not um, worried about how they're dressed, like they're there. So let's just spell it out. What's, What's so troubling to us about this parable? What's so troubling to us? It doesn't sound fair. That's, that's definitely true. And it, it, it in some ways undercuts, or it seems to undercut what we know about the gospel. If the wedding feast is an image for the kingdom of God, why is there an inspection for those who come? Why is there any judgment at all For those who come to this feast, who have accepted the invitation, gotten off the rear end and come. Why are they being judged? I thought Jesus bore the judgment for all who come to him. How can anyone then be judged and cast out? That's what we've got to wrestle with today. Now, one key to this whole parable, and we'll see how this works out a little bit later, one key to this whole parable is the answer that the man gives to the king. What does he say? Nothing. He doesn't say, hey, you didn't tell me there was a dress code. He didn't say, hey, you should have told me earlier I can go back and get the garments I need or I'll put them on. He says, no, no, he didn't say any of that. Now, one thing you should know as you read the Gospels and any part of the New Testament, actually, is not only is it God's word, but Jesus is God. So that when Jesus tells a story, he chooses his words very carefully. He crafts his parables very carefully. He's not, he speaks off the cuff, but when God speaks off the cuff, it's not like us speaking off the cuff, right? He, it's, it's, it's good stuff when he does that. So that means that the man, that, that, because that's true, that the man says nothing means that he has nothing to say. He has no excuse. There's no exculpatory evidence offered. Now that implies that he knows he should have and he knows he could have worn the wedding garment. Whatever the garment represents, everybody there, both the whiskey drinkers and the teetotalers, both the uh, wicked and the evil, wicked and the good, Everyone else there had a garment. Knew they needed one and wore one. So whatever the garment represents, there's no excuse for this man not wearing it. Now, um, the first part of this parable, verses 1 through 10, as we've seen, is a warning to those who refuse to come to the feast, to Israel. The second part, verses 11 through 14, is directed to those who have heard the apostles and come. What that means is that what we're reading here is a warning to the church. It's a warning to you and to me. 
What is the warning? To answer, we need to know what the garment is. What is this garment? What did this man lack? And how do we make sure that we do not lack it? (laughs) Now, there are two answers to that question, and therefore, in this passage, you will see that there are two warnings. To understand the first warning, we need to begin at the beginning, so why don't we turn back to Genesis chapter 3, where I had you mark earlier. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3 is the account of the fall, the sin of Adam and Eve. They eat the forbidden fruit. Everything is going great until they do that. And then it starts going really, really badly. Um, And um, when they eat this fruit, you see that I think the eating of the fruit is in verse 6. What do they realize? We're naked. naked. I don't know how they didn't know that before, but suddenly they they realize um, they're naked. All right. And so... Because they're naked, what do they decide to do? Verse 7, it'll tell you. What do they, yeah, make a cut. Bill's right. In verse 7, it says, they decided to make clothes. Now, before they were naked to God and to each other, and they had no shame, now they've sinned. They sense shame. They want clothing. So, what kind of clothes do they come up with? Figs, fig leaves. I googled this. I didn't know what a fig leaf looked like. I mean, maybe that's because I'm just not a botanist. But I looked it up, and they're not they're big things. They're kind of small fig leaves. I mean, I don't know how they did that. I mean, and it didn't look all that comfortable either. But um, they they figured out some way to cover themselves with these with these fig leaves. Now, here's a question: What do you think God makes of their efforts? To clothe themselves. How could we answer that question? We can look in the Bible. Let's look at verse 21. Verse 21, we can see it. Um, And in one word, what God thinks of their effort to clothe themselves is insufficient. Insufficient. Not good enough. How do I know that? Because of what we read there in verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed them. God took away their fig leaves and clothed them himself. He took away the clothes that they had made and replaced them with clothes that he had made, the garments that he sewed together. And what's interesting here is that God shed blood to provide Adam and Eve this sufficient clothing. Their clothes, don't miss this, in skins. Do you see that? Now that might just be a little bit of Old Testament trivia, and now you can go play a Bible trivia game and win. Um, But that's not what it's here for. And in fact, if you... Read through the whole Old Testament. What you will see is that Genesis 3 sets up a contrast that runs throughout the Old Testament between garments that humans make and garments that God provides. Let's take a look at this theme in just a few verses. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah 64 In this theme, as you're turning, I'm talking. In this theme, the garments we make symbolize the things that we do to justify ourselves. The things that we do to justify ourselves. The acts by which we hope to balance the scales. You ever had a really bad, bad night and you wake up the next morning and you say, you know what, I really got to do something good now because last night I really messed up. All the things that we try to do to balance the scales, to show ourselves good before God. 
That's what these garments come to represent. The epitome of that is here in Isaiah 64, verse 6, where we see God's view of the garments human beings make for themselves. We've read this before, but let it sink in. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. I won't tell you what the Hebrew Hebrew says there. It's not pretty. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Not the evil we do. Not the evil we do. The good things. The things you take pride in. And think to cover yourself with. And I do it too. Those are the polluted garments. They will not do. It doesn't seem to make sense to us, but let me see if I can help you with this. Because, and it goes along with what Jesus has been saying all along in the parables, uh, this text in Isaiah does, but let me, let me try to unpack this just a little bit. Until you surrender your heart to God, every good work that you do is just a brick in your own personal Tower of Babel. You want to reach up to heaven but you want to do it without depending on God. You like Frank Sinatra. You want to do it your way. So your heart, then, even in those good works, is in rebellion. You're not working through God or with God, but you are actually working against Him. It's not like God needs your works. Remember we talked about that. He doesn't need it. He could do them himself. Remember the parable of the two sons. The elders and the chief priests did good works. In fact, if you knew a Pharisee in the first century and you compared his life to your life, you would say, wow, that guy is holy and I'm wicked. Because they were pure. They did good things. Unlike anything that I could ever imagine or hope to imitate. The elders and the chief priests and the Pharisees did good works to build themselves up and to cover, Jesus said, their hearts with their works. And it doesn't work. God's not stupid. He's not an idiot, right? He can see right through that. And so Jesus said in the parable of the two sons, basically, your works are lies. You're just lying to God. That doesn't help you. They tell a lie about your heart. And that's why Isaiah says here in Isaiah 64, 6, your good deeds are polluted garments. Signs of pride. Signs of self-sufficiency. Now, turn back in Isaiah. Keep there. I I didn't have you mark this, but I want to show you the difference between the garments that humans make and the garments that God provides. Look in Isaiah 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Now we read this. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Who's the actor here? It's God. God has covered me. God has made these garments, is what Isaiah is saying here. God clothes his people with sufficient clothing. Now, all of this comes together, and you can turn here if you would like. You don't have to, because it's hard to find if you don't know your Old Testament well. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3. He's one of the minor prophets. You can find him if you look long enough. But in Zechariah chapter 3... The prophet Zechariah has this vision. Has this vision. And in this vision, a guy named Joshua, who is the high priest 
of Israel is standing before God's throne. Now, what the high priest did, what priests did in the Old Testament, was they stood as representatives or symbols for all the people of Israel. And that's what Joshua is doing here in Zechariah chapter 3. And this is what he said, this is what happens. Now, Joshua, the high priest, was standing before the angel, beginning in verse 3, clothed with filthy garments. He's representing the people of God. Before the face of God, he's clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments. Behold, I have taken away your iniquity and I will clothe you in pure vestments. You see that all comes together there? Joshua, God's people personified in Joshua, is dressed in rags. God, through his angel, removes his filthy garments and provides righteous ones. Pure best ones. I think this theme of humans seeking to clothe themselves versus God clothing us is what Jesus is going back to in this part of the parable in Matthew 22. And so here is the first warning to us, to you, to me. You cannot trust in your own garments. You cannot trust in your own goodness. You cannot trust in you. You cannot trust in your baptism. You cannot trust in taking communion. You cannot trust in your church attendance, in your volunteering, in your giving, in your compassion, and in your kindness. All very good things that God commands us to do. But you cannot trust on those things to make you acceptable in God's sight. Because really, without your heart, those things are mere fig leaves. They're nothing. Nothing. They are insufficient. You cannot justify yourself. God sees through the stuff we do to our hearts. And if your heart is unsurrendered and proud, then you are in rebellion. And your good works are polluted. Jesus calls everyone, come to me as you are. If you're dirty, you're clean, come on. Come to me as you are. <clears throat> but to come means, and I'll just quote Paul here, and I want you to listen carefully to this. To come means not having a righteousness of your own that comes from obeying the law but the righteousness from God that depends on faith. It's Philippians 3.10, if you want to look that up. See, because Paul was a Pharisee, right? He was one of those righteous guys. He even said, according to the external works of the law, I was perfect. Can you imagine saying that? I was perfect. But now I consider all that rubbish. Why? Because he saw that he was doing it all from a heart of rebellion. He was trying to justify himself rather than relying and trusting in the righteousness that God offers to him and to you and to everybody. So here's the first question I want to ask you today. Have you cast away all confidence in yourself? You cannot receive the gospel. You cannot receive Jesus until you take that step and cast away self-confidence. Confidence confidence in your own righteousness because you're not righteous. Neither am I. Are you coming to today's feast in fig leaves? 
There are many who hear the gospel preached over and over and over again. They hear this call over and over again, and they continue to reject it. Well, my, my grandparents went to church here, and I've been to church all my life. And I, you know, of course, I know, I've read the Bible, I know Jesus. But the question is, have you cast away all confidence in yourself? And are you trusting in Jesus? And there's such joy when you do that, because then you're free to enjoy Jesus and bask in his infinite love for you without worrying about earning it. I mean, you don't have to earn God loving you. You just, you trust what he's done on your behalf. And then he loves you. You're, 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 he, lo- he loves you. He wants, to, he wants you to be with him. But that can't happen if you're trying to justify yourself in his sight. You've got to... Let go of yourself and receive him. You're free to enjoy him then without worrying about earning his love. You're free to enjoy each other as messed up as we all are. This is the wonderful thing about, about trusting in a foreign righteousness, a righteousness that is not your own, is that you then get thrown together with a bunch of messed up people just like you, and you get, to, you get to be with them um, without looking down on them because they're not as righteous as you, right? That's what religious people do. Um, or feeling condemned because they're more righteous than you. Because the fact is, we're all wearing somebody else's clothing. That's why you're here. So there's nothing to boast about and nothing to feel condemned for because Christ has given us our garments. So that's the first warning, I think, here. There is a second warning. And it's related to the first. Because when some hear that God forgives sins and gives righteousness on the basis of faith, they think, all I have to do is believe That Jesus died for my sins and rose again. Say a prayer. And I get an eternal pass. So they profess faith with their lips. But they continue to live like hell. Like rebels. Now the word for faith. That's used in the New Testament, and if you've been here for a while, you know this, but it's good to review, is pistis. It's the Greek word pistis, and it doesn't mean mere mental assent, just agreeing with a set of doctrines, agreeing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, or agreeing that he was virgin born, or agreeing all that stuff. That's not what this word pistis means. Let me give you an example of what it doesn't mean here again, uh, and what it does mean. You might... Uh, for example, agree that statistically airplanes crash far less than automobiles. How many believe that? I can prove that to you, so you better believe that. I can, I can demonstrate that to be the case. My mom believes that. She knows that to be true. She's read the books, but you know what? To this day, she will not get in an airplane. Uh, she drives from uh, Texas to New York because she's so afraid, even though she knows the stats are that she's much more likely to get in a wreck driving up here than she is flying, especially the way she drives. She's a horrible driver. She sits in the left lane at like 60 miles an hour talking on her cell phone all the way to New York. It's horrible. But she knows this stat. She knows this stat. She knows it to be true, but she's not going to ever get on an airplane. That's not faith. That's mental cognitive assent. I believe this to be true. I'm not acting on it. But I believe this to be true. Faith is actually buying the ticket and getting on the airplane. Faith means full and total surrender of mind, heart, and body. Now, here's why this is important for our parable. Because Jesus, as you know, promises to make his home in the hearts of all those who have faith. 
Not cognitive belief, faith. He gets in there, he goes to work. He gets in there, like if you've ever seen those home improvement shows, the really messed up, horrible house. Um, they, someone buys and they go in, they start working it out and renovating. That's what Jesus does in your heart. He buys the house, he gets in there, he starts cleaning stuff up. It takes all your life, but he does it. He gets it cleaned up um, and he works from the inside out. And the first, one of the first things that happens when this takes place in your heart is you begin to love him. Love him. And that love for him evokes in you a desire to please him and feelings of you're feeling bad when you know you haven't pleased him. And so over time, your thoughts and your words and deeds reflect that truth. Your life changes. Now, here again is the point for this parable. There is no real change if you're merely playing the game. Saying the words, believing the propositions to be true without committing and sacrificing your whole self. Because apart from faith, the Holy Spirit does not make his home in your heart. So that's why Jesus has these strange parables every once in a while where he says things like, um, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. How are you going to know whether someone's a good tree? Well, you check, test his works. Wait a minute, I thought we were saved by faith. Yeah, if real faith results in real works. That's why you have that parable in Matthew 25. Who remembers this? It's kind of scary. At the end of time... Jesus is going to come back and he's going to separate everybody into two categories. What are those two categories? Sheep and goats. What's the basis of that separation? Who knows? Good deeds. Yeah, he's, he's saying, all right, we've well, fed the poor, you've visited the prisoners, you've, you've done acts of compassion. So you're one of my sheep, you come in. Now, you could read that and say, wow, that contradicts everything else in the New Testament because I thought we were saved by faith. No, it doesn't. All Jesus is saying is true faith necessarily works itself out in your life by a changed life. And if that change is not there, faith isn't there. So that's one of the markers. Now, we can't look at other people, but God can look at us and see if those markers are there. God knows that. That's why James says, faith without works is dead. Not because works comprise any part of your salvation. They do not. But because true faith results necessarily in increasing freedom from sin. True faith is not a fig leaf so that you can sin. That's how some of us think of it. A fig leaf so that you can sin. It's not that. It is freedom from sin. So the second warning that Jesus gives in this parable, I think, could be summarized in this way. And let's go ahead and open to our last bookmark, Matthew chapter 7. And we'll see how Jesus, I think the point that Jesus is making in this parable is the same point that we see in chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. And I'll just read it to you. Probably one of the scariest passages in the whole New Testament. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's a lot like the guy who got kicked out of the feast, isn't it? Same point. Now, that's, like I said, a scary passage, and probably for me anyway, the most scary and most disconcerting word in the entire passage is found in verse 22. And that's the word many. In Greek, that's polos, and that means many. Many. 
So think about this. This is a warning to the church. Many will call Jesus Lord. Many. I have no doubt that some of us here will call Jesus Lord who are not known by him. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't know, right? He's, he's omniscient. Here we're talking about know, like Adam knew Eve, like husbands know wives and have babies. That's what we're talking about, a relational knowing, right? Unknown in that sense. Now turn back to chapter 22 of Matthew, and we'll close this out and see what is going on finally. Because in our parable, the very last line gives us the same warning, that same second warning that we saw in Matthew 22, which is, many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. God calls everyone, everyone. Come as you are. But to come, you must be willing to give up your whole self. And let him clothe you in his garments and remake your heart, mind, and soul. The man cast out of the feast came in a fig leaf. He came in polluted garments, trusting his own righteousness, the first warning, and was unwilling to surrender and be remade in Christ Jesus, the second warning. Many, says Jesus, many in the church have the same attitude. Many. So my second question to you is, are you one of the many? Are you one of the many? I can't answer that question. You can answer that question. You know. Is your heart surrendered? Are you trusting and the righteousness that comes from God by faith? Or are you trusting in the righteousness of your own works, which is not righteousness? Are you willing to give him your habits and your addictions and the secret sins that no one knows about in your head, on the computer, wherever, and follow him? Are you willing to hand those over to him? If you are, then what we listen to, what we hear here, is you are known by him. So, as we've been saying over and over again over the last five weeks now, um, this is a tough parable. You know, we used to think of Paul as the hard, hard-nosed guy, right? This is Jesus who knows our hearts and who knows our minds. And this represents a call. And it's not just a call for those who are outside outside of Christ to repent and come in. That's That's huge. That's part of it. And if you haven't done that, you need to do that today. You need to do that today. There will be people back there who will pray with you if you're willing to. I encourage you, I urge you, I pray that you will hear and heed this call. Repent and turn your heart over to Jesus and your life over to Jesus. For everyone else who has done that, This is a gut check. This is a gut check. What are those things in your life you're holding on to and you're clinging on to and you're refusing to give over? Again, for the fifth time in five weeks, give those up. Bear good fruit. Offer them to Jesus Christ. He loves you. He wants to embrace you. He wants to take you in. Repent and be saved. Lord be with you. (laughs) Father, thank you. Um, Thank you for this parable. And thank you, Lord. Often we have an image of you, Jesus, that is is false. We we like to think of you as the 
uh, I guess the, the always soft spoken and always exhibiting um, tenderness. And sometimes, though, Lord, you speak hard words, and those hard words are meant to soften hearts. Lord, I pray that you help us see that today. I pray for anyone here who is living in a way that is contrary to their profession. Lord, move in their hearts today. Bring them to repentance. Bring them to repentance, I pray. Lord, I pray for anyone who is standing outside, maybe worrying about his or her own goodness and whether she can make it or he can make it into the kingdom. Lord, you are the cleanser. You are the clother. Lord, move in that person's heart, Lord, and bring them, uh, bring him or her uh, to your son Jesus today. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Stand together and profess our faith.